The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. God gave me the title of this message, and at first I'm going, um, I don't know uh, what, but I'll obey. And I started researching it, and it really came alive. Uh, I I was in prayer, wasn't quite fully awake, didn't have my coffee, but God kept saying, uh, teach on the way, the way. And and when I began to uh, come to my senses, I went to uh, some material, and <clears throat> come to think of it, everything we're teaching on the Didache, the first six chapters, they called the way. And there are two ways, the way of life and the way of death. That's the very first verse of the first chapter of the Didache. <clears throat> and so um, this way, as it says in the Didache, chapter 1, Verse 1, there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there's a great difference between the two. I like the original, it says, and great is the chasm between the two. There's a way of life and the way of death. And so everything they taught new believers was on this way of living. So it's not so much just what you believe, it's how you implement it in everyday life. They were looking for a lifestyle that would turn the world upside down. Uh, change lives to such a degree that people say, I think those people are in the way. And I don't mean it in the way like get out of my way. All right. I think those people are in the way. That way, that, that new uh, believing in, in Jesus as the Messiah, and they have a way of life. And so I really want to talk about that this morning on the way. Uh, the second verse in chapter one of the Didache says, the way of life is first this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Secondly, your neighbor as yourself. And whatever you don't want done to you, don't do it to somebody else. Kind of a reverse golden rule. Now, the teachings of these words, verse 3, the teaching of these words is this. Bless those that curse you. Say good words about people who say bad things about you. How's that for initial training? This is like day one. This is like taking a new novice in and teaching them. And basically, they would disciple for many anywhere for a year to three years in this. So it wasn't like they read this once and go, oh, I got that. I do that all the time. I bless those that curse me and I pray for them. You think it would take the grace of God and a submission and a welcoming of a changed life in order to cooperate? You know, apart from him, you can't do this anyway. He is the way. So you're going to have to be with him in this way. Now... It says, secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. Whatever you don't want done to you, don't do it to somebody else. Now, the teachings of these words is this. Bless those that curse you. Pray for your enemies. Fast, fast for those who persecute you. Most of us don't fast for our friends, yet alone fast for someone who persecutes you. Do you think these new New believers were challenged just with that statement. If they said, I am sincerely going to be part of this way, I think that would be challenging, wouldn't it? And what would happen is there would be a transformation in your heart to where you would begin to have the heart of Jesus. You'd get the eyes of Jesus. And you really don't see life the way it's supposed to be through the eyes of Jesus until you have the heart of Jesus. Your perception will be always, always kind of uh, negative, blurred. But if you love those who hate you, you will have no enemies. First three verses, chapter one, first six chapters are called the way. There's a way of life and a way of death. And great is the chasm between the two. Great is the difference between the two. Okay, so 
I'm looking this up and, and I, I saw that right, right off the bat, uh, these two ways, it reminded me of something that we taught in uh, even marriage counseling. We use three words, three W words. And if you really want some how-tos on how to reevaluate and check yourself out in your marriage, in your relationship with God, your relationship with other people, we use the word, the will, the way. Three W words. The word, the will, and the way. Now here's something. <clears throat> Those three words are consistent. God wants to build out of resurrection life. He wants to build a body, a holy temple of living stones. But he builds, and if you're a note taker, it would be worth it to write this down because you're going to see uh, uh, growth in your Christian walk once you get a handle on it. God builds according to a pattern based on principles. Much of the what we call the how-tos are nothing more than principles. You know, the people of God saw the acts of God, but Moses knew his ways. And ways are the application. And <clears throat> I really feel like God is speaking to the church that we need not so much greater knowledge as much as we need greater application of that knowledge. And wisdom is the application of knowledge. Wisdom is actually the principal thing. Knowledge is good, but it needs to be used properly. Now, the word, the will, and the way. If you start with the word, <clears throat> real life change takes place when your word level is intimate. His word is truth. But another word you can use in some translations with, with truth, reality. How much of your word level is reality and how much is your word level cognitive? God wants to take it beyond cognitive understanding. It's not just ink on a page. When I was a young Christian, and I was in the school of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit said basically, and then I had it corroborated later by Madame Guyon in her book. But before I'd read any books, he said, I want you to stay on the Scripture, not just reading for content, which is good. I want you to stay on a Scripture till you met the author. In other words, Jesus and His Word are one. And I want you to move from the written Word to the living word. So how do you move from the written word to the living word? He says you stay there until it has a sense of life. Your spirit bears witness is the biblical terminology. My spirit bears witness with his spirit. So that means I'm touching God. And when God was teaching me this, he confirmed it by taking me to <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 4.12 says the Word of God is living and powerful. And that got my attention because God was speaking in my prayer time that it's the living Word. It's not just ink on a page. You must move beyond that into the reality because the Word, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And it's a living Word. So I should be able to sense life and certain aspects of the Word should how do we say, leap off the page or bear witness or suddenly uh, magnify itself in, in uh, light of the rest of the scriptures. That's the way God speaks. And it was this living word that's powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, divides asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And I like that part because when you press into the word as a living word, what it does is it reveals motive. You'd be surprised how many uh, Christians have been Christians for years and they judge themselves by the external activity. You get into the living word and he starts judging you by your motives. That's a far deeper and a far more superior work of the word of God. When the word of God discerns you, and before you worry about discerning someone else, let the word discern you. It's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than the two-edged sword, it can separate flesh from spirit. But here's the part that, that I've never forgotten <clears throat> and, and uh, continually have learned that you can 
uh, progressively appreciated even more, and that was the 13th verse, where it said, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. And it just, it got written on the tablet of my heart from that time on. The living word is Jesus. The living word is not mere ink on the page. The living word is him. And all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. So when you're reading the word, <clears throat> you're not reading for mental understanding alone. You're reading to let him examine you. You're letting him look at your heart. You're allowing discernment where it truly does begin. Discern you first. Let the word discern you before you worry about discerning. You know, everybody that God told me this and God told me that. And go, I, I would spend a little bit more time with God discerning you before you are so quick to discern what's going on. Because, uh, <clears throat> and then we're going to get into it. I think great is the chasm between the two. There's a walk in the spirit and there's a walk in the flesh. And uh, I want to cover some of the differences. But the word is first reality, and it's a person. The second one was the will. <clears throat> and uh, after 20 years of being a, a, a pastor, uh, and of course it's been 40 some years now, but at 20 year point, God dealt with me and says, if you had it to do all over again, Dennis, what would you teach? knowing what you've seen in 20 years pastoring. And I said, I would teach on the will. I still think it's the least understood. The devil wants your will, and he's working from the outside. God wants your will, but he's working from the inside. And people don't even know where their will is. They point to here for their will. And so I'm saying, <clears throat> if I had to do over again, I would teach them that the will of God is like a river. Matter of fact, we have a book called The Will of God is a River. Um, <clears throat> Because it's an understanding that it's a flow of life. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's a relationship. And there's a flow. And you can go in and out of the flow. Just like if you were in a, in, in a fast-moving river or a supernatural jet stream. I like the term jet stream because that's a, there's a force up there. You can be a, out of it and you can be in it. And when you're in it, there's a flow. And mark what I'm saying here. A, a righteous man... There is a highway. It says the lazy man, and I thought this was interesting. The lazy person, life is like a, a hedge of thorns. So I'm going, wait a minute. So then if you're righteous, there's a flow. But if you're lazy, life is actually harder on you than it needs to be. But you made it that way. What, what do lazy people usually think? I'm just going to take it easy. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not, I'm going to relax. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And then they seem like all kinds of turmoil breaks out in their life, one problem after another. Well, I don't think lazy works, do you? I think there's something wrong with that. Now, there's a highway, but it's a highway of holiness. But yet, at the same time, he makes the rough places smooth, raises the valleys, removes the mountains. So we're going to cover that a little bit. But I want you to see that when it came to the will, the word is Jesus. The will is every place in the scriptures, particularly in the Gospel of John. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. I only do, see, hear, say. I and my father are one. The, the word of God is reality. The will of God is oneness. Okay? Married people. The goal is for intimacy. That's the word of God. This applies to God, marriage, friendships, whatever. The word is reality. And the will is for oneness. Is it producing oneness? We talk, to, we talk with young married couples, and, and it's more about ecstasy. Well, quite frankly, that's not the goal. 
It's intimacy over ecstasy, and it's oneness over selfishness. So the word is Jesus himself. His will is for oneness, and the basis of everything Jesus modeled for us, particularly in the Gospel of John, was I and the Father are one. So out of that oneness, you see, you hear, you say, you do. All right? So you should write this down in your Bibles in a margin somewhere because it's a wonderful self-check. The word is reality or truth. You can use either word. His will is for, does it produce oneness? Always look at the fruit. Does it produce oneness? And lastly, his way is always love. So his word is reality or a person, Jesus. His will is for oneness and his way is always love. You could take those three W words and apply it in any, any study to where you're trying to draw near to God. You can find one of those W's is missing or on a tangent. Right now, we're living in a time where in the cultural atmosphere, the pressure is to uh, <clears throat> comply. Am I right? Is there a pressure to comply? But here's the truth God gave me in this time and in this season. Yes, I know there's times to resist, there's times to rebel, and there's proper ways to do that, and there's uh, right ways and wrong ways. But God took me back to an original truth. When I was a young pastor, um, I must have had an anointing for this, but I, my church was loaded with Jezebels. And guess what? You won't believe this. I prayed them in. Huh? You say, who in their right mind would do that? But I saw that God was showing me a truth, and he tested me on that truth. To this day, I believe I have a Jehu anointing. All right, so look out. <laughs> but it was, you cannot control someone who's under control. And the portion of scripture that God used of all things was when they went to push Jesus off a cliff. Hmm? And what did he do? He, he walked through the midst of them. You cannot control someone who is under God control. I'm not talking fighting control with control. That's carnality, and that's what a lot of people do. If there's a controller in their life, they try to control right back. It doesn't work. But you cannot control. So, talk about your hair standing up on your back, your neck. I was pastoring about, uh, I think, three years at the time. God was teaching me this truth on a one. So I says, you know what? There's a lot of Jezebels out there that need saved. And not only that, some pastors were calling Jezebels someone who is merely a strong woman. Uh-oh. You know what? We need strong leaders. We need some strong women. And we need to know the difference between a Jezebel and a strong woman. I always used to say, this, this goes back a long ways, but I always saw Margaret Thatcher as a strong woman. I didn't see her as a Jezebel. You know what I mean? You make the difference? Now, Sonny and Cher, Cher, she was a Jezebel. As a matter of fact, she was under psychiatric care. That, that little vamp that she would do, Sonny and Charity, I don't even remember what I'm talking about. That little vamp that they would do where she would kind of emasculate him, it came easy to her. That was something she was getting counseling for, to emasculate, to dominate, to fail to cohabitate. It's, and it was, and even the way she dressed on the programs, it was an exaggeration of womanhood. That's all indications of a Jezebel. But God showed me that if I yielded to him, if the peace of God rules, nobody can rule someone that's under God's rule. So instead of running here, hither, thither, afraid the sky's falling, afraid somebody's going to control you, which often means if you're fearful that they're controlling you, you have a control problem. You're fighting control with control. 
but if you're under control. So anyway, three years into the ministry and one of my Jezebels, <laughs> and I loved them, and I was believing for redemption, but they had some very strong characteristics. But if they couldn't control you, the funny thing is they ended up respecting me. <laughs> I couldn't understand that and <laughs> at first. But one day they came and said, Pastor, there's this woman. <laughs> well, these are, these are my strong, even Jezebel-type women, and they're afraid of a woman. Hair stood up on the back of my neck going, I don't know, this has got to be Lucifer. <laughs> if these women are afraid, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> so I said, I'll talk to her. Drop back down to my spirit and realize, you can't control someone that's under control. When you're, when, and, that, and what that means is your yes is yes, your no is no. Or I'll pray about it. And I don't have to give a reason to every Jezebel on why I said or why I did what I wanted. Yes or no. Anything of that is you're entering into manipulation. It's of the evil one. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else is of the evil one. So I said, I'll talk to her. And they said, oh, you'll talk to her. She's on her way to your office. I go, well, everybody else made an appointment. <laughs> this one's just showing up. <laughs> so I opened the door. And right before I opened the door, there was a knock on the door. God gave me, told me what to do, and it sounded kind of like, oh, I, that's not me, but I'm going to do it. I opened the door, and she went, hey. And I said, look, God gave me a word for you, and I am committed to love you with all my heart, no matter what. Now, what do you have to say? <laughs> and eventually... Oh, she tested me. But eventually, this has been probably uh, in the late 70s. Eventually, I had a reputation for ministering to people, but my pastoring was more like out of my house. You know, it wasn't official. And she said, I'm going to sponsor you. And I was sponsored and ordained for the first time based on proven ministry. Not based on Bible school completion, based on proven ministry. And I'll tell you what, you know what? That's the way everybody ought to get ordained. Based on proven ministry first, not a credential. But I thought that was interesting because I, I was uh, ministering mostly out of my house, but I, we had a little building. It was a vacuum cleaner building that we had church in. But uh, all these strong women, many of them became quality leaders. A few of them stayed problematic, and to this day they might be problematic, I don't know. But a lot of them became quality leadership. But the way they, they operate is with control. Control is really a form of witchcraft. You know, it's included in the works of the flesh as witchcraft. That's manipulation and control. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Anything else is of the evil one. I, can, I learned this from, a, from a, an 80-year-old woman who was in my church. <clears throat> she was a divine appointment uh, and later came to my church, and she basically said, when they call me on the phone and it's a telemarketer and they say, well, why won't you? She goes, I don't need to tell you that. It dawned on me. We're not obligated, are we? If you say no, no thank you, I'm not interested. And they say, why? I'm not obligated to tell you that. I thought that was a wonderful response. Because what, what people try to do is get you to do it their way. But you can't control someone who's under control. I think I'm sidetracked here. I want to get in the rest of the message here. Is that good, though? Hey, we all need that. So you can't control someone. And if someone's talking to you and you feel like you're walking backwards, there's a push. I mean, even if you don't walk backwards, you feel the push. Well, we trained uh, young Allison when she was a teenager, didn't we, Jennifer? Because we work in the house, two computers, same room, 
And Allison, of course, as long as mom and dad are in the house, they can't possibly be doing anything significant. Uh, she would come and stand in the doorway. Allison would be what they call a detemperament, a cleric, a mover and a shaker. She didn't say a word, and you could feel the... And I'd say, Allison, if you ask your mother anything now with that push, the answer is going to be automatically no. And she went, huh. And all of a sudden, the push was gone. So they have the capacity to not push. If you can say, I can feel the push. But see, they think she was a D temperament, which means they think and win-lose. You push, you lose. Oh, <laughs> that's not good. And she would release it. And then what it does is it opens you up to actually find out what is the will of God in a situation. And we were both really busy. But, I, but when I felt her release that push, it, there, there was an anointing to want to help her. I say, Allison, what is it you want? She goes, I want to ride to the mall. Can somebody just drop me off? I get my ride back. I'm meeting a friend. I go, okay, I'll take you. You don't have to push to get things done in life. And if you're of that theory, you probably shot yourself in the foot more often than you really needed to and pr probably blamed the people and circumstances on your push. Hmm? You know what it's like? Did you ever go to a door where they had it labeled wrong? We used to go to a restaurant where they had the door push and pull. And it would say push, and it was a pull. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> and they go, oh, they just have this label wrong at pull. Your life could be like that. Until you allow lordship, I and my father are one. And you can't control someone who's under control. You will literally walk through a crowd if necessary. If, if God is in charge of your life, nothing's going to happen apart from that is in his will. And there can be good things and bad things that take place. But he's going to get you through it and in some cases remove the blockages. In other cases, get you through the blockages. Either way, it's a win-win scenario. So his word is reality, his will is for oneness, and his way is love, and his will really needs to be lordship. There really needs to be that I only do what I see, I only say what I hear, and everything I do, I do out of that oneness. And the way is always love. When you're flowing out of that oneness, love even if you gave a corrective word from the love of God, you'd be surprised how well it's received. All of these so-called uh, Jezebels, and I don't like to label them like that, but they were very carnal, pushy. Um, and I found out later that I had my women teach other churches uh, intercession. Because at that time, intercession was really coming in the late 70s. Early. It was coming to the forefront. And there were some intercessors that thought their job was to control the pastor. That's witchcraft. And I had mine, who were formerly <laughs> a little on the pushy side, actually go in and teach others, churches, how to do intercession properly. From, intercession should be a humble ministry. It's not a proud I know more than everybody else type ministry. And so you can make leaders out of people, but you've got to start from the place that nobody can control somebody that's under control. You want things to go well in your life? You're going to have to learn lordship. You're going to have to let the peace of God rule. As a matter of fact, I recommend that once you know how to get an emotional healing, once you know how to forgive from the heart, once you know how to let the peace of God rule, take the peace challenge. I think everyone in the church ought to take the peace challenge. Before you make a business decision, let peace precede that decision. You'll make better decisions. People that make decisions when they're angry and upset are almost always going to shoot themselves in the foot. Because even if it was a good decision, the timing will be horrible. You know, you can do something too soon and too late simply because you're anxious or fearful or angry, hurt. Now, <clears throat> the Didache, the
the first six chapters that they discipled someone over for a period of a year or more was basically the way of life and the way of death. Choose, therefore, life, of course. Choose the way of life. But it also had to explain to believers, new believers anyway, and I think used believers, that the corrupt way needs some instruction. Listen to some of the scriptures in our Bible that talk about the corrupt way. It says, so God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh <clears throat> had corrupted their way on the earth. So the tendency is flesh will corrupt its way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is what? Destruction. But up here, it seemed like a really good idea at the time. Did you ever do any of those? Well, it really seemed like a good idea at the time. But the end was destruction. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Uh, I, John Bevere did a book that I think every Christian should read, Good is Not God. Because the enemy doesn't usually throw evil, evil, blatant evil in your face. He'll give you something that's good but not God. Hmm? That's how he deceives. There's a way that seems right. But if I and my Father are one, if I'm walking in the peace of God, peace won't lie to you. And by the way, this is not peace. Here's a false peace. Oh, I've got to get that new car. I've got, to get, I've got a peace about it. I've got a peace about it. No, that's called adrenaline. That is not peace. I've got a peace about it. It's time for me to get a new, new dress. Uh, it's time for me to get a new car. It's time for me to get a boat. I've got a peace about it. I got a peace. You know, you can talk all the Christianese you want, but guess what? Who, do you, who are you trying to fool? It's really between you and God. If you want things to go well with you, if you do good, things will go well with you. If you do not, it's not. Romans 1 talks about, you know, the futility of their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were dark. And professing to be wise, they became fools. Deuteronomy 30, it started way back then. See, I have set before you life and good, death and evil. <laughs> it would seem like this is not a hard test. <laughs> But he even had to give the answer and say, I recommend you choose life. <laughs> That's pretty bad when someone's got to tell you the difference. But Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, here's that scripture that really got my attention. Proverbs, this is good to write down. Because this one, to me, uh, shed light on the scenario of life. Proverbs 15, verse 19. <clears throat> the way of a lazy man is like a hedge of thorns. And the way of the upright is like a highway. Wait a minute. So it's smooth sailing, because in some cases, God will remove the obstacles and you walk right through them, or through them, either through them or he removes them. It doesn't matter, but that's the way of the righteous. It doesn't mean there won't be trials and tribulations in your life. It just means that he'll get you through them. There's no temptation except common to man, of which there's not a way. There's always a way, and he is the way. You stay in him, and you go through and you don't have to understand everything that's going on. It's called trust. Now, it says, the way of the lazy man is a hedge of thorns. What was it Cliff, Cliff said earlier? It says, a lazy man, God even just messes with shrubbery. He can mess you up with shrubbery. <laughs> well, a hedge of thorns is a little worse, right? So picture this, a lazy person. Uh, uh, let's see, the proper terminology for this day and age would be entitlement. <laughs> the entitled person 
It's life is like a hedge of thorns. I'm so special, I deserve. But everything's going wrong in my life. Well, that's predictable. You're not on the highway. <laughs> Lazy, sloth, it's one of the deadly sins. The entitled person is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the upright is a highway. You know, this reminds me of when I worked in the factory. I was in the steel workers union and did everything from push the broom, sweep up the area to learn to apprentice on a, fa on a machine. Uh, it was a huge corporation, uh, three major plants all in a row, uh, <clears throat> like an assembly line. They built tank cars. Uh, that's railroad tank cars, those things that look like hot dogs, shaped vessels on the train, all right? And I used to do the, the ends of those. I used to shear them on a giant can opener and then dish them every. But anyway, while I was in the factory, I tried to learn all these different jobs. And when things got tough, there was other things I could do. But there was this group who spent, they're pushing a broom, they're not learning an apprenticeship or anything, so if there's a layoff, they're gone. They're pushing a broom, but they didn't want to push a broom. They spent all, looking underneath the tank cars, looking underneath the railroad cars in the plant to see if they could see a foreman's shoes. Because if, see, we wore steel-toed work boots. A foreman wore steel-toed dress shoes because he was, he was tie and white hat. They worked harder at looking for a foreman's shoes than just doing any old job. Come on, you ever see that in the factory? I see a head nodding over here. You've seen that in, in uh, automobile companies and offices everywhere. There are some people who just know how to avoid the boss I once knew of a person that worked in church that always complained he was on the computer day in and day night, had to work overtime all the time to get the job done. Um, they worked for me. And when I left, they hired somebody to do their job for 10 hours a week. Wow, someone pulled the wool over my eyes. I had always suspected that they were playing on the computer a lot, not necessarily doing church work. 10 hours to replace their 40 plus hour week when they were the boss. Are there people like that that actually spend more time trying to find a way around work? Even fake it like you're working? Looking for foreman's shoes? You know, I used to look at that and I go, you know what? Uh, <clears throat> to kill time, I'm going to clean this quarter of the factory floor. And I looked, and sure enough, by that time, it was lunch break. Was easier than seeing if I could just walk around and not do something. Is this ringing any bells? I hope your life's not like this. Hmm? Are you at work looking to see what you can get away with not doing? <laughs> Proverbs 15, 19. The way of the entitled or the lazy man is a hedge of thorns. The way of the upright is a highway. Hmm. So God can take a way through it, just like he walked through the crowd. But he can also remove obstacles. Look at the promises in the scripture. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places will be made straight. The rough places will be made smooth. That's a promise for someone who's walking the walk. That is not a promise for everybody to just claim and then live whatever way you want. I've often said the big mistake the church made was they had those little promise boxes. Now, I love the promises of God, and those things are uh, yay and amen, but there should have been a commandment box. If you do this, then you go for the promises, but not if you don't do the commands. The way of the wicked is like darkness, Proverbs 4.19.
and they do not know what makes them stumble. Now we know confusion is not of the Lord, but the people that are accomplishing the least often will say, I don't understand, I don't understand, I'm confused. Well, where does confusion come from? It says if you're walking in wickedness, if there's unrepentant sin, you don't know why everything's going goofy. So you want to be in the know? Get your heart right. If you are, John 7, 17 says, if you are willing to know, if you're willing to do, you shall know. If you're willing to do his will, you shall know. How are you going to know? You have to be willing to do. <laughs> if you're not willing to do, don't think you're going to know anything. You're going to be walking around stumbling in darkness. You're going to have more questions about life than you have answers. <clears throat> no. What can we say about God's way? God's way is number one, perfect. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to everyone that trusts him. Number two, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. His ways are not like people's. That's humility right there to acknowledge that. The third thing is sinners stumble. Let him know, for the ways of the Lord are right. Hosea 14.9. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. The ways of God are everlasting. His ways are everlasting. They're unsearchable. His judgments and his ways are past finding out. Just and true are your ways, O Lord. Now, <clears throat> if we have time, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess with you a little bit here. <clears throat> just in case this wasn't hard. I like a good hard message every now and then. Just, just makes you smile. All right. Israel complained for times in the wilderness. And what I find interesting, we have a message on the, the uh, seven deadly seas, complaining, criticizing, competing, comparing, concealing, coveting, and controlling. They're all deadly. And in the wilderness, they did them all. They controlled, they concealed, they complained, they criticized, all right? But the people complained to Moses. There's 14 of these. The people complained to Moses, and because of him, his talk of a promised land, and you might be experiencing this, Pharaoh clamped down. In other words, just when you're getting the promises of God, <laughs> what's the enemy do? He clamps down, all right? And what did the people do? They complained to Moses. You know, he's talking about these promises and these good things that are going to happen. And, and, and now my life is getting tougher and tougher. Now I got to wear a mask at work in my cubicle. And I'm not allowed out of my cubicle. <laughs> it got tighter. As soon as you heard the promises of the glory of God's coming, an awakening's coming. So you don't want to do that. Don't complain. You're going to say, watch what God's going to do. Because we know what Pharaoh and the enemy is going to do. He wants you to comply. He wants you to comply. Oh, do you like that word, comply? If you have a core value of personal freedom, this will get your goat. Hmm? But at the same time, nobody can control someone who's under control. Let the peace of God rule. If peace rules, God rules. If God rules, nobody can control someone who's under control. The second, the second complaint. The people complained and said to Moses, leave us alone. Leave us alone. There's impossible situations here 
in Exodus 14, 11, and 12? All because we listen. I listened to those other people that were believing for God. I listened to those prophetic words. And now I'm, no, look at what's happening. I want to get out of here. This is too hard. Anybody, when you first got saved, want to quit? Did you ever go to quit? No, I did. This is too hard. Of course, it usually lasted a few hours, a little temper tantrum. And <clears throat> then I had to get healed of that because I thought a temper tantrum was a way of expressing to God that you were really serious about it. And he'd say, no, that's very childish and immature. Oh. I just thought I was building, making a case. <clears throat> the third one, <clears throat> the people complained in Exodus 15 about bitter water. And that's kind of like changing your diet. All of a sudden, God says, now, there's food and drink. I have food that you know not of. My food's to do the will of him who sent me. Going, I really would rather have a cheeseburger right now and french fries. Leeks and onions in Egypt were pretty good. There's, all of a sudden, there's an internal conflict. And they complained about that. And they complained about bitter water. They complained they were hungry and they didn't want that manna. That's supernatural food. We don't want, I want the old stuff that I'm accustomed to. I want it my way. I want to go to McDonald's because I deserve a break today. I need to go and get away. See, those jingles are tailor-made for your flesh. The people complained about being thirsty. After five complaints, God got out the belt. There's a lesson in here somewhere. After five complaints, the people forsook the Lord, and the Lord had 3,000 people but killed by the sword because they worshiped the golden calf. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You know, God didn't do bad. They chose a different way, and that was the consequence. It's interesting. One, I remember early on when I was first saved, like, can Christians have a demon? And that one guy answered and he goes, Christians can have anything they want. So he got out the belt. And guess what happens? And this is what I want to see Kingdom Life Church people do. When everybody, if they're getting, they're getting, total devastation. They might be in your family. They might have been former friends. They might be church people. Who knows? All of a sudden, Moses interceded. However, it doesn't mean you intercede one time and you got an answer. Jennifer intercedes every day for a group of people for a long, for years. A little over a year. So after five complaints, God brings out the belt. <laughs> Moses intercedes for the people. Oh, God, save these people. They don't know any better. They don't know any better. Is that what you do? Do you intercede for the crazies? Do you intercede for the Jezebels? Do you intercede for those that are considered enemies? And then the seventh time, the people complained about the food. The eighth time, Miriam and Aaron complained about Moses' leadership. That's the second time Moses interceded for the people. <laughs> well, there's 14 times they messed up. Five times Moses intercedes. The people complained about how difficult it looked to conquer the giants in the land, and they refused to enter. The people complained against and wanted to kill Moses. I'd say he had some issues in his life, don't you think? They wanted to kill him. They want to select another leader. This is the third time Moses intercedes for the people. We know this is the tenth because God said they tested him ten times in verse 22. He's, they've tested me ten times. The Lord kills the ten spies by the plague. Oh, the key leaders rebel against Moses. This is the fourth time Moses intercedes. Poor Moses, he's got to keep interceding for his people. It's not done just praying one time. The people complained again. This is the fifth time they intercede. Oh, we're getting to the good news, people. We're getting to the good news. The fifth time Moses interceded for the people, they complained against God. 
fiery serpents started biting him. <clears throat> but we hit the solution. Moses was told by God to lift up a serpent on a pole. And if they would just look to that. Why don't we just do that in the beginning instead of waiting for consequences, like 14 of them? Wouldn't it be better to just look to the salvation and see that by looking at that serpent raised on the pole, that he became sin for us, that we might be free from sin by receiving him. Let's pray that right now. Father, right now, we look to the cross. We look to the cleansing and the forgiveness. I don't want to live in a way that just brings destruction, heartache, negativity. I want to walk in the way that God has showed and I'm looking to you even this day. That's the good news. That seeing myself, that I don't stay in the way all the time. I fall off the path. And I'm receiving. I'm letting God discern my heart right now. And I'm asking him to cleanse me from the times that I fall off the path. And when I have a supernatural exchange on the inside and I've got peace, I know that I'm looking to the solution, the salvation that God has provided for me, the redemption, 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 redemption. That is the answer in all of these complaints against Moses, against the key leaders. It's interesting that after that serpent was raised and the people were healed, that the record shows something in their mind and their heart changed after that. And the complaining wasn't there. They still entered in an occasional sin here and there. But something dramatic changed in the children of Israel after that incident. Something in their heart and their mind changed permanently to the complaining, the criticizing. All of that, suddenly there was an awareness that, that wasn't getting them anywhere. That's not the way. A golden calf, all... All of the rebukes, all the five times that Moses had to intercede for them, yet the beautiful solution was that somehow, by looking to that serpent hung on a pole, typifying the redemption that we have with Jesus on the cross, somehow after that, say that with me, after that, after that, there was an acknowledgement that the way they were behaving was not the way. And, and you could say logically, it's beyond logic, isn't it? It's just supernatural. It's a supernatural seeing, hearing, and understanding because they, were, they had a pillar of fire and a cloud by day, fire by night, cloud by day, manna, supernaturally, the crossing of the Red Sea. It wasn't like they didn't see the acts of God. The part is there was a heart change that had to take place. They still had much of Egypt in them, even though they were delivered out of Egypt. And, but there was something about that beautiful placing that serpent on a pole, and when they looked to that, they were healed. And from that time on, there was no complaining, murmuring afterwards. We need to be that significantly changed. So if your life is not going that well or you're looking on the external, particularly if you're looking at the compliance pressure, just remember, I'm telling you, you can test it. Nobody can control someone who is under control. You will either go through it or it'll be removed and be made a highway for you to walk on the smooth sailing. So that's the promises of God. So, Father, we're going to walk in that way. And we're going to love the Lord our God with all our heart. We know that your word is reality. We know that your will is for oneness. And we know your way is always love. Always love. So, Father, we thank you this day that we have chosen that way to live. And we have chosen to look upon Jesus on that cross and know that our redemption is always available and that we don't have to act off the path from this day forward in any significant way. We're going to walk in a new walk.
we walk according to the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Was that hard enough? Clap if it was hard. Uh... You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.